Great. Well, we are here to talk about um, internal coaching capability and why it's important and how it can be your organization's superpower. Richard and Randy have put together a great presentation for everyone and we'll be walking y'all through the material. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we will have a Q&A portion at the end. So please make sure you're using the Q&A feature so that it doesn't get lost in the chatter. Um, so I will let Randy and Richard take it from here. Thanks, Rez. All right, we're gonna begin with why. Simon Sinek would be happy with this. Why is, why is this an important topic? Why does it matter? And we're gonna hopefully do a good job of exploring all of the different points and complexities of this topic. But there's a few things that in our experience are really important. One, typically the whole reason we're having a conversation around any level of need for coaching um, is because we're trying to go through some kind of a change as an organization. So if we're going through a change, coaching is a key hack, if you will, to help us get to better sooner and also create a higher ceiling for what's possible with the change. I think those are two really important aspects uh, on the impact of coaching. Um, one of the things that tends to be uh, a big challenge that gets discussed up front for any kind of initiative where we're going through a, any level of change is, you know, what's the dip going to look like? And then how quickly can we get up the change curve to the other side? So coaching is an important enabler to, you know, reduce the depth of the dip and accelerate our ramp to a new normal. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. And kind of playing off of that is for me, quite simply, it's about building sustainability. So if we can get better faster, if we can raise that ceiling, as Randy said, um, those are all good things. But how do we sustain that? How do we build the capabilities uh, into our organization so that we can actually sustain the achievements that we're, that we're reaching. And ultimately, uh, in the spirit of agile change, ultimately, we're trying to get to some level of resilience so that as new change comes our way, as new challenges come our way, we can respond to those much more quickly. We can bounce back from things that might uh, knock us a little bit off center. Um, and these are the things that that we're going to explore today as we talk about how do we, you know, how do we go about building a capability? Why is it important? Right. All right. So what's what's the context here? What's the what's the opportunity in front of us? Let's dig into that. From from my perspective, it's about the impact that we can create as a coach and understanding what is happening within your organizational context and how do we connect with that. If we can understand what's important, what matters to your senior leaders, what are the things they are paying attention to, what matters in your culture, you know, what, what is valued within your culture and how can we leverage those things and amplify them um, you'll probably hear me when I say coaching, I will probably say coaching without the agile in front of it. Um, there's a reason for that. Agile coaching is absolutely critical. Agile coaching is really at the core of what we're here talking about today, but we're also talking about, you know, just the ability of coaching in and of itself, um, whether it's, you know, in an agile context or not. So, the thing that is important here is just to really understand we're not just here to quote, do all the agile things right. If, if I've seen situations where people with a, a label of agile coach have had one predominant focus, which is, are we doing all the agile things right? And they weren't able to have that higher level conversation to connect why doing certain things in a certain way supports 
that higher level impact that we're trying to create. And so being able to have that connection is critical if you want to really demonstrate your value. So what, what are we after? Like, why is coaching needed? Organizations are con consistently and continually in pursuit of new, better results. There's almost always some level of focus on how can we improve this aspect of how we operate? You know, how can we improve the, our effectiveness as an organization collectively? And so if we want to get different results than we've been getting up to this point, we need to do different things. These different things show up at every level of the organization from how are the teams working to how are leaders leading and how are we reviewing our priorities and how are we making strategic trade-off decisions? There's any number of things that need to be different if we want to get these different results. So working through those changes and you know they kind of go through ebbs and flows. There's going to be times where there's probably gonna be some more large scale, potentially more dis disruptive kinds of changes. Hopefully there's a continuous flow of smaller adaptations and changes, but coaching is really there to help optimize that. And this, this is my term, right? There's a lot of different ways to characterize this, but it's, we're going to try the new thing. And I like the word try because no matter how much documentation we put in, how much training we do, we're not going to nail it perfectly. So we're going to try it. We're going to reflect on how that went. And we're going to learn from it and adapt. The capability of coaching really helps optimize. It helps us get the most out of that cycle. So we go through fewer cycles and adapt quickly to get a better result. Yeah, Randy, I, you know, I think across, you know, all the organizations you and I have worked with over the years, I think everyone gets that idea of, of, you know, inspect and adapt or try, reflect, adapt. What I see is that getting that to kind of built, be built into the way we think continuously is definitely off, often a challenge. Yeah. And so uh, another important aspect to the overall context and, and how we can make sure we have the right message around the importance of coaching is also looking at it in terms of how are we showing up if we are, you know, either in a formal coaching role or in a role that is a, adopting a, more of a coaching stance, could be either scenario, what's the focus that we really want to see from senior leaders? And we really want that dual focus of being an environment builder where we're, we're creating the right system so that the right things happen a lot more frequently with you know, a lot more um, autonomy, a lot more decentralization, those kinds of things. So looking at our from two, like where are we today? What, what are these better results we're trying to get? How does our environment need to change to better support these results? So the more as coaches, we can engage in senior leaders with that kind of a conversation around, it's all about the environment. Um, that's critical. Uh, the people development aspect, obviously that's important. Hopefully that's valued and understood. But if we want senior leaders to really dial up their focus on being an environment builder, we really want to help them understand and leverage the interconnectedness of all the aspects of our, our system of work or uh, operating model is a word I like to use a lot that seems to resonate with senior leaders. You can't go ask teams to do different things and get better results when the rest of the system is optimized for what we've always been doing and what we've always been getting. So as coaches, again, 
whether you're in a role, you know, that's called an agile coach or whether you're just bringing your coaching skills and stance into whatever interactions you're having, helping senior leaders to understand all of these things are interconnected is critically important. And coupling that with evolving the role of middle management, we're going to talk a little bit later about an interesting, um, very recent uh, development by uh, a pretty big well-known company on how they're evolving the role of middle management. But we really need to enable middle management to also um, start to shift more into that, that coaching stance as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, going back to Randy, you teed up the kind of the raising the ceiling and I talked about sustainability. You know, one of the reasons this topic and this, this idea has been important for me to talk about is that too often leadership and organizations at large think of agile transformation, common term that we've used over the years, but they, it tends to be thought of as this thing that we're doing, and it has a, you know, a start and end to it. And organizational change, bringing about sustainable change, raising that ceiling, that's an ongoing, never-ending responsibility. And that's why, you know, Rand and I feel like this is an important topic because this is not about agile per se. Um, it is about building the capabilities, building the muscles as an organization to continuously be able to create this environment to better respond to change. And unfortunately, a lot of organizations uh, will rely heavily on people like Randy and I, who are external coaches, and not really think about what it means to build an internal capability. So we're curious, we're gonna have a little poll here, a couple of poll questions as we go through this webinar. Uh, you can use the QR code on the screen or you can type in the link or text as you see. The first poll question is essentially, you know, do you feel that your organization appropriately values agile coaching as a skill or a competency? So simple yes, no, or maybe. Let's see what, uh, as folks go through this, see what the response are showing up. Okay, a bit of a mix. All right, Randy, any parting thoughts on that first section before we move on? Yeah, I guess it, the only thing I'll say is uh, I've got one really um, highly, remem mem highly memorable story um, that I'm not going to go into right now, but the, the no... You know, we see a lot more no's than anything else here. And one of the things I've seen is agile coaches focusing on doing the right things and completely either unable or unwilling or maybe both to go have any of these conversations that we teed up with even, even middle managers, much less senior leaders to understand what really is the opportunity? What's the why behind these things? How do all these things interconnect mm -hmm. so that you can get the better results? And, and when you can't have that conversation, then that senior leader is left with no other choice but to interpret agile coaching as just like you're the you are the process adherence. It's a it's an agile process. These are the people who help make sure we're adhering to the agile process. Like that's probably their mindset. And yeah. that's probably valuable for them for a little while. And, and then it's no longer valuable. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And so, you know, the no's here sort of validate our hypothesis that there's, there's often a lack of awareness or uh, understanding of how bringing the skills and capabilities into the organization can actually help for that long-term sustainability. So why do we think it matters? What is the impact really? You know, Randy led off with impact. This is really about 
creating the environment so that you know organizations can can thrive and you can continue to respond to change. So this isn't simply about promoting coaching as a profession or as a skill set. We need to create the right impact into our organizations. And as as we were thinking about this topic, you know, Randy and I kicked around this idea of of areas of emphasis and and the impact that they can bring. And a couple of obvious ones that came to mind are this idea of coaching versus managing. And you know, middle managers, I've often uh, referred to them as the Rodney Dangerfield of agile transformations in the past because they they often don't get enough respect. Uh, and I've seen it too often that they. They get uh, either relegated to the sidelines because some coach comes in and says, you know, create autonomy, managers get out of the way. But but we don't really help them understand, well, what new skills do they need to build? Mostly what we see out there in, in the area of so-called agile transformations is around go help our teams do better. Go help our teams deliver faster. Go help our teams be more predictable. But there's often not enough emphasis on managing. So this is not calling out managing as bad. It's recognizing that often middle managers and even senior leaders just don't have those capabilities. They've not been given the opportunities to learn these things. And so, you know, that coaching capability is going to help shift toward the nurturing style of, of building high performing teams, of making sure we're building in this, this idea of learning first. Whereas, you know, traditional management style is going to be focused on utilization and doing all of the things and making sure that everybody's busy doing work. And while those are important, right, we really want to emphasize the coaching and the learning aspect of it. The other dimension in terms of emphasis and impact is around culture. And we know that uh, in our experience, bringing about change, a new way of working into the organization is simply not just about implementing new processes, right? This is not just about implementing Scrum or scaled agile framework or whatever methodology or framework uh, you're interested in. It's really about understanding how your organization, your team, your systems respond to change. How do they adapt as they, as they go through this? So it's really about making sure that the, we emphasize on the areas that are gonna bring about that impact, bring about that that sustainability. And, you know, coaching, focusing on learning and culture is often where we see the emphasis is needed as we start looking at those capabilities. So this idea of leader as coach. Um, and so this is this is the key element that Randy alluded to. We're not talking necessarily about uh, putting uh, the role or title into your organization of coach. What we're talking about here is building the capabilities and the skills that you need. So our position is not just that coaching is, is simply a progression from Scrum Master, or we want to take our project managers and convert them into Scrum Masters or coaches. This is about building capabilities, a coaching capability and skill set up and down the organization at all levels. So there's that individual level. We've got individual contributors and individual managers that need support to how they can learn and how they think differently. Um, we need teams, obviously, that need support. How are teams going to be able to adapt? How do teams keep improving their way of working? How do they build really good uh, you know, teamwork and take on big problems? At what we call the system level, where we have complexity across teams, we've got complex ecosystems. How do we bring agility into that? How do we bring that coaching capability into seeing the system itself? And then even with senior leaders, how do we do this? Um, and I got this quote at the bottom of the slide here, picked up somewhere along the line uh, from Simon Sinek. And what really struck with me was the point of bridging that gap, kind of being that, uh, for middle managers particularly, being in that role where you can you know, bridge the strategy with the tactics. And it requires building in this, this idea of being a student, of being a learner, being able to not, you know, have to be the expert at all times. And this is one of the starting points of these capabilities as we start to build them out. 
I often like to talk about you know culture, but I like to talk about cultural awareness. Uh, culture is something that uh, I'm I'm kind of a, a culture curious, so to speak. I'm not a culture expert, but I've observed a lot of different organizations over my career, as has Randy. And what I like to focus on first is fo is starting with what we call cultural awareness, right? Not about changing the culture because that's something that is going to evolve over time. But it's really about understanding who we are, where we are today, so that we can better help lead and drive the change that we need that are going to fit within our culture. And most leaders, in, in my experience, are either uncomfortable or ill-equipped to deal with the cultural question. A um, couple of quick little anecdotes here. So I had one client uh, way back in the day. Um, we were just kicking off a big uh, agile transformation effort, had all the leadership in, in the room, about 60, 70 leaders, pretty large organization. We had just done our initial assessment and we're laying out the roadmap for them. And I had a few slides in the presentation around cultural awareness, around, you know, we had some questions in our initial assessment about their culture. And I'm about halfway through that particular slide and the CIO pounds the table and says, you know, why are you talking to us about culture? You know, we hired you to implement Agile. <laughs> Everybody in the room just kind of cowered in their seat. And he went on to say, we don't have a cultural problem here. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no problem. But as I'm reading the room, right, even his most senior leaders were kind of shrinking in their seat because they did not want to touch that topic. Um, conversely, around that same time, I had another client um, who I was just getting started. We were going through some workshops and a couple of their key leaders showed up at one of our workshops. It was the early days of, of their transformation. And one in particular, she just kind of lingered in the back of the room. She didn't, she didn't directly engage. She, she lingered in the back. She was observing. And at the end of the workshop, she came up to me with her, her little aha moment where, you know, we had been talking about culture a little bit but she didn't make that connection. And simply by observing and by kind of tuning into what her people were saying in this workshop without intervening, without trying to you know, you know, control the, the narrative, she was simply observing and getting a sense of, of what people were saying. She was very quick to grab onto this idea that you know, if, if she and her fellow leaders didn't understand of their cultural norms and how to navigate that, they were not going to succeed. So it's just it's just a couple of simple stories that say, you know, we can reject this idea of culture or we can, you know, be aware of it and we can understand what it means to us. Now, a couple of models that Randy and I like to use in our work are, uh, are shown here. The first one at the top is called the pyramid of results. And this one is really about recognizing that if we're attempting to bring about sustainable change, we're trying to create new results for us as an organization. Either we need to be more competitive in the market, we need to be more predictable, whatever that may be, we're not going to get there simply by implementing methods or frameworks. We need to start at the cultural level. We need to create new experiences for people that are gonna change their belief systems. And as people start to have experiences that they can internalize and connect to, and if their beliefs start to change, hey, we really can do great things. We really can raise the ceiling. Then the actions and the results will follow from that. The other model here, the little quadrant uh, image, is from the competing values framework. And we use this quite a lot to talk about, you know, what is our cultural orientation? Are we more of a command and control style organization? Are we more of a collaborative organization or a creative organization or a competing or a market-oriented organization? There's no right or wrong culture, but if we don't understand where we are today, then navigating change, bringing about new ways of working is going to be much, much harder. So we use these two models, and as we all know, you know, all models are flawed, but some are useful. We use these two models a lot to really get an understanding of where are we today and how do we bring about that sustainable change? How do we raise that ceiling? And a coach has some of the similar ways of thinking about their style 
as a leader would. So if I'm coaching in a collaborative environment, you know, I need to focus on being a, a facilitator and more of a mentor, right? Whether I'm in a role of a coach or I'm in a role of a manager. If I'm trying to bring about more uh, creativity or uh, you know, bring about more agile way of working, that's that upper uh, right-hand quadrant, I need to help teams or I need to help other managers understand how to think differently, how to create uh, innovation, how to bring more vision into what they're doing. So this is something that whether you're in the role of coach or you're a manager trying to build your coaching capabilities, having that understanding of what is your natural style, what is your home base, so to speak, and then understanding the direction that you're trying to go as an organization is critical. Right. Let's see, let's go to the next poll question. So our next poll question is, if you're in there, we got some images here. So what image best represents your organization's so-called agile maturity today? See, be curious to see how people view this. Are you just getting started? Are you a virtual newborn? Are you getting your legs underneath you? You're just kind of learning how to, to walk and run. Are you a champion? Maybe you guys nailed it in your organization. Maybe there's a little chaos going on. We're having some methodology wars inside our organizations. Or are we just going through the motion, right? Is it the you know dawn of the living dead? <laughs> or have you tried Agile before and it didn't work? So it's just dead at your organization. Seeing a mix, at least one, one organization's just getting started. Got a little zombie agile going on and then a little bit of chaos or some methodology wars. Randy, you've got a lot of experience around the culture aspect in the management. Any, any specific thoughts you'd like to share before we move on? Yeah, I think one useful complementary point is it's critical to understand the current culture in terms of what is valued mm -hmm. and find ways. I, I always use the, uh, the analogy. Uh, I've never studied martial arts in my life. Like maybe there was like one, one, when I was in Cub Scouts, maybe we did one thing on martial arts for like an hour one day, but that's about it. But I know enough about it to be able to use the judo analogy. Judo, I know enough about to know that it is predominantly um, predicated on using your uh, attacker's force against them. And so not that we necessarily want to think of our existing culture as an attacker, but we do want to take that organizational um, energy and what we value and we want to find really productive ways to redirect that. Um, one of my favorite examples of that is we uh, we really desire uh, predictability and we really value efficiency. So when you have an intense efficiency valuing culture, a lot of times that's where you get the classic, we want to focus on velocity. What's our velocity? How do we improve our velocity? I like to create a measure of the value of the work that is being completed so that we can redirect that efficiency focus from how much work are we doing, focus it on the efficiency of how valuable is the work that we're doing. So you're, you're taking that existing cultural predisposition, what do we value, and you're redirecting it in a more positive manner. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So for the audience out there, you know, regardless of where your organization is today in terms of so-called agile maturity, I want you to kind of hold on to that as we go forward because you know, coaching and building a coaching capability might have 
a different implication. It might look a little different depending on where you are as an organization. So uh, if you're the organization that is, is newly into some change, agile transformation or other change, it, it may require a different set of skills or a different set of capabilities versus if you're trying to resurrect something that is either dead or close to dead, you might need some different capabilities there. So understanding your organization's cultural orientation, understanding where your organization is in its change journey um, is an important aspect of, of what we can bring to the organization through these coaching capabilities. So what are some attributes of a good coach that we wanna focus on? So I like to start with mastery. For me, uh, I didn't start out as an agile coach. I was a, a manager leader uh, before I found my way into the agile world. Um, and frankly, back in way back in the day, I was a pretty traditional command and control program manager, product manager, functional manager. But I started learning about uh, you know, what agile meant, and I started learning about what coaching meant. And I, I became fairly locked into uh, this idea of mastery of, you know, mainly because I was learning from other coaches that were setting a real high bar to what it means to be an agile coach. And so I like to emphasize mastery. And I think it's important if we talk about, you know, inside of our organizations, building these capabilities. These are not, you know, hit the easy button and all of a sudden I have everything I need to be a good coach or to coach people. It's, it's a continuous process for me of continuing to, to refine my skills, to continue to learn more, to master what it means given the circumstances. Um, I'm guessing most of the folks that are joining us today have some awareness or experience around coaching. And so these uh, so-called agile uh, coaching stances might resonate with folks. Um, but coaching is a professional skill. It's a craft. Um, and it goes way beyond agile coaching, for sure. And Randy and I aren't, aren't here to, to get into the broad spectrum of all of the aspects of professional coaching. But this idea of coaching, there are specific skill sets and capabilities. They also include, being a coach or coaching also includes you know, when do I need to show up as a facilitator, be neutral in terms of the outcome, but hold the space for folks to be able to solve critical problems? How do I bring mentoring into my organization, into my team, into my peer group, right? Mentoring, it for me at least, is about sharing my experiences, my successes, and more importantly, my many, many failures so that other people can learn from that. There's obviously a, an aspect of teaching and advising that goes along with this as well. And that's part of the reason I like coaching as a profession is, is that it allows me to do the dance. I can, I can decide in any given moment, in any given situation, what is needed, what, what is being called upon. And I have to then be able to adapt to that. I've got to be able to, to respond to that as needed. And that's, that's a big difference than just uh, let's say if we're a scrum master, our primary focus is helping our team master the scrum framework. And there is naturally some process and some rule following that goes in there as, as Randy was alluding to the martial arts example, okay? Um, but being able to then bring a broader set of thinking is really critical here. And again, this is not just about a coaching as a title or a role. This is about building these capabilities, whether you're a scrum master, a coach, uh, a manager, a leader, regardless of what your title is, software engineer, it doesn't matter. If you want to help your organization, your peers succeed, building these capabilities is what we're really talking about here. Now, coaching, particularly agile coaching, um, has taken on, uh, you know, a, a very much of a uh, Kind of a cultural component as we talked about earlier and earlier i used the word uh, when i was talking about coaching of nurturing high performing teams and this is a a bit of a take on a talk i did a couple of years ago around you know attributes of role modeling and i've adapted it into what i think some of the attributes that make up a good coach now 
I don't possess all 13 of these. I certainly don't possess them consistently, but I strive to build these attributes, build these traits over time. And depending on the situation, you know, I need to understand well, what attributes can I bring to help this situation. A couple of that I really like to focus on off the top are role modeling, servant leadership, and self-awareness, right? We've, we've all heard about servant leadership. It's been around since the 1970s. Uh, role modeling is one that I think is important, particularly, again, if we're talking about building the capability of coaching, regardless of our role and our title, particularly if we're managers or leaders, um, we're expected to lead by example. We're expect we need to be good role models so that people will adapt. That was one of the elements when I was talking about the uh, results pyramid a moment ago. That we're not going to create sustainable change just by telling people to do different things. We're going to create change by creating new experiences for people that change their belief systems. And the best way to achieve that is by modeling the behavior we want to see out of our people and our organizations. So if, if our words don't match up with our actions, right, we're not going to come across as authentic. People are, going, are not going to buy into what we're trying to help them accomplish long term. The third bullet I want to talk about as well around self-awareness, again, going back to the topic on culture, is that I have to understand what is my natural style? Am I more of a facilitator? Am I more or am I more of a coordinator, right? Depending on what my natural style or my preferred style is, helps me better position how I'm going to respond to the needs of my organization or the needs of my team. Now, I don't expect folks to, to see all of these 13 attributes and, and check every single box. But what I encourage you to do is think about what are your strongest attributes? And if you can map those here, and then you can build on those, you can leverage those and these work together. So for example, when I was talking about uh, role modeling, if my actions don't line up to my words, I'm not going to come across as authentic. I'm not going to get people to really believe in what I'm trying to accomplish. So these have a relationship. So I encourage you to think about what are your maybe your top two or three attributes that you feel most confident. You may also identify a couple of attributes that uh, elude you, that are a little bit more of a challenge for you. And if you can find peers, uh, if you have a cohort internally, or maybe the, maybe you can build an internal coaching community practice inside your organization, you can help each other learn how to kind of build these capabilities, build these skill sets over time so that you, again, can raise that ceiling and have more sustainability to what you're trying to accomplish. All right, so all that sounds great, but we also recognize that, you know, being an internal coach inside of an organization or coaching from the inside is very different than coaching as an external coach, which is what Randy and I do for a living. So when Randy and I go into an organization, um, we're often viewed as uh, more credible. Uh, we're bringing fresh or new ideas. If the organization's spending money to bring Randy and I into the organization, then it's more often than not, people are gonna listen to us because uh, you know, we're external. But being internal to your organization gives you a ton of advantages as well. But that's met with some challenges. And I've, I've interviewed many internal coaches um, over the years and even recently as we're preparing for this webinar. And the themes that I was hearing from these internal coaches uh, was the same that I've been hearing for years is, is that it's hard as an internal coach uh, to keep people uh, tuned in, right? Over time, uh, it tends to get to be a stale message, or maybe they don't really have the authority, right? They're, they're a coach by title, but the hierarchy or the politics are such that they can't really bring about that impact, right? Now, if you're a manager or uh, an individual contribut contributor, but you don't have the official title of Agile Coach, you're likely still going to face the same challenges, but because that role is not explicitly attached to you, you can probably circumvent some of those challenges a little bit more easily. But we want to acknowledge that it is challenging to bring about internal coaching as a skill set, internal coaching as a role, uh, because a lot of organizations uh, 
the hierarchy is not set up in their favor and the organizational uh, norms and expectations are going to be a little bit different. Uh, Randy, before we pop up the, the next poll question, any, any yes ands for that? Uh, yes and I'm gonna save them. Awesome. All right. So we got one final poll question we wanna check in. So on this topic of, of being an internal coach or bringing coaching to your organization, what are some of the unique challenges that you all may be facing with your organization? So uh, just gonna use a, a simple word cloud approach here. So as you're contemplating this, think about you know, what challenges your organization might face or do you face as an internal coach or someone trying to build an internal coaching capability? So we're seeing definitely seeing a pattern around trust, habits, resistance. Again, these are things that as external coaches, Randy and I see this all of the time, um, but because we're external to the organization, to the system, um, that gives us a little bit of a, a veil, at least, if, if not uh, explicit license to, to try different things. Um, and again, I can speak for myself that as an external coach, um, there obviously becomes a time where my message doesn't resonate as well with the organization, but it's, it's pretty typical that when I go into an organization, uh, people expect that there's going to be some disruption of the status quo. They expect that there's going to be change that's going to be happening. Um, and that's a very different experience often than having to deal with this from the inside. So this is why, again, we'll go back to, uh, we'll say this one more time, is that we're not talking about injecting the role or title of coach into the organization explicitly or as strictly. We're talking about building the capabilities and the skills needed to coach the organization. And I believe anyone can learn these skills. These are not exclusive to particular individuals or, or types of individuals. I've seen many people that I've worked with in organizations that have the, the capacity and the aptitude to learn these skills, um, but they're certainly going to be met with some resistance. They're going to be met uh, with some deeply embedded habits that you're going to have to work through. All right. So what does this all mean? All right. How do you, how do you build the case? or building your coaching capability. <clears throat> One of my favorite questions to ask is what would a 10% improvement be worth? In, in my experience, in, in my journeys, I can't think of one environment where there wasn't a possibility within a certain given timeline, like we're talking quarters, not months, but the possibility of a 10% improvement, I don't care how you want to measure it, to be honest. Like you I would be, I would challenge anybody to stump me. Uh, I'll I'll find a way to deliver on that 10% improvement. So pick your measure. What's important to the organization? Is it we want to be 10% faster to market? Is it we want to be uh have 10% higher employee engagement? Is we want to have uh 
10% uh, improvement in customer sat or whatever the, whatever the measure might be. And then ask the question, what investment would it be, would we be willing to make as an org if we could get that 10% improvement? Mm -hmm. Probably yeah. many of you are working in organizations where maybe there's a $10 million budget. You know, if you think of all the teams that are delivering, maybe there's $10 million, maybe there's $50 million, maybe there's a hundred million dollars. Like, you know, we've certainly worked with organizations that are well north of a hundred, hundred million, but let's say it's a $10 million. $10 million organization, you want a 10% improvement with like, so you want to get $1 million better work, you know, worth of better results out of that $10 million. How much would, would you be willing to spend to get $1 million more value out of that $10 million? Yeah. And Randy, I think one of the key accelerators to this, this idea is this idea of compounding interest, right? So, hey, could we get 10% yeah. better and then 10% better? Or if you mentioned predictability, uh, competitiveness, time to market. So if we can get 10% better over here and then 10% better over there, that has a compounding effect, right? That's really, that goes back to your raising the ceiling. That completely blows the ceiling for you of the opportunities that your teams and your organizations can achieve. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the, the, the last question on that on that last slide is, can you measure it today? Because often it, it, it's e either it's sort of measured, but it's flimsy or it's not really measured at all. So be careful there. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways, you know, there are strategies and proxy measures that you can sort of put in place while you're implementing like a more complete uh, measurement strategy. Uh, I want to talk about a recent shift. I, I literally just learned about this, I think it was last week. Um, it was on Jason Little's um, YouTube channel. Uh, uh, Jason Little's uh, the uh, lean change management uh, guru, if you will. And he was, he was talking with uh, T Ken Ricard about a recent study and we give a link to it well not a, not a study an article about uh the organization bayer b-a-y-e-r and they announced about a month ago that they're going through a pretty drastic organizational change really quick click on the raise hand button on your zoom if you have heard about the capital one story from uh, i guess it was like maybe 18 months ago at this point, was it that long ago? Yeah, at least. Definitely see some, some raised hands. So if you were intrigued and potentially frightened or like concerned by the Capital One story, um, Bayer is almost like the complete antithesis of the Capital One story. Uh, for those who are not familiar, Capital One basically made the decision that anybody with an Agile, anything in, in their title was gone, pretty much. I'm probably exaggerating, but I'm a huge fan of hyperbole. So um, exaggeration is kind of my jam. But I think that's not far off from the truth. Like Agile coach, gone. Like even like the role of Scrum Master, if I'm not mistaken, like I think they, they reinvented maybe like the terminology, but they by all intents and purposes, uh, they gutted the organization. Bayer is doing the opposite. So thanks. Apparently Greg has uh, some insight. Greg said, true statement. Um, Bayer is doing the exact opposite. They have, uh, they're implementing a new operating model and they are calling it dynamic shared ownership. And what the article says is the goal of this is to reduce bureaucracy and hierarchies and that to reduce managerial positions. So what Richard talked about earlier in terms of the difference between coaching and managing, 
If you squarely show up in the managing bucket in that organization, you're probably not going to have a position in the coming months and quarters as this change take, takes effect. And, you know, what seems to be, I, I am, you know, lacking uh, intimate details of exactly what they're doing, but what the direction seems to be, get rid of, you know, management and implement, you know, a more, um, I'll use air quotes, a more agile operating system so that we don't need all these managers that need to be in the middle of all these decisions. Mm -hmm. yep. Here's a, a couple of references. Um, Business Agility Institute, uh, along with Scrum Alliance, published the uh, Skills in the New World of Work report. This just came out in uh, like late November. Um, one of the things that they found was that there are three top skill combinations that are in most in demand in organizations. Management plus product, like product management, product leadership, management plus technology and management plus coaching. And they found that in terms of the gaps between market demand and what companies are looking for and where people are focusing their energy from a professional development perspective, the biggest gap is the demand for management plus coaching is outpacing how many people are spending time and energy developing coaching capability in themselves. Mm -hmm. And then also there's there's the link to uh, an article that talks about what, what Bayer is doing. So these hopefully are a couple of data points that you can also use if you're working on making your own case, a couple of really good external uh, resources. Right. So we wanted to make sure we included a couple of these extra sources. I mean, obviously, Randy and I are bringing our experience, uh, our you know, our passion to what we've learned over the years and what we're seeing. But we know there's much more out there. And quite frankly, this is one of the themes that we've talked about is, is this idea of learning, continuing to be a student of of this. So regardless of your role in your organization, you may be a scrum master, you may be a product owner, you may be a coach, you may be a manager, you may be a tester, a developer, regardless of your role. We believe that each of you can possess and build these capabilities um, in the spirit of helping your team, your systems, and your organizations improve. And the more you start to model some of this behavior, the more you start to show what uh, coaching brings, the impact that it brings to the organization, uh, you're, you're likely going to get other people interested. And, and so how can you help others embrace this idea, whether it's a peer or a manager? Um, what sort of challenges will you be facing in your organization? You know, certainly, Randy and I uh, are here if folks want to have conversations. You can use the QR code on the left or uh, submit a contact us form and someone can reach out to you if you'd like to schedule a call. Um, also, Randy and I are planning a, a Agile coaching workshop coming up in a couple of months. Uh, it is tied to the IC Agile Agile coaching certification. Um, it's This is one of the ways that I learned. I went through this workshop uh, about 12 years ago as I was starting my coaching journey. Uh, and this is something that we believe is, is again, it's a skills that can be learned by anyone. All right, Randy, any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Um, uh, if you want to go to the next slide while we start on the Q&A, okay. um, feel free. Uh, I'm always open to any kind of a LinkedIn uh, invitation and Rich, Rich, Richard's the same way. So feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, feel free to submit questions via the Q&A capability in Zoom. I know we're coming up on time, but uh, Diane uh, had a really good question from 40 minutes ago. Sorry to make you wait 40 minutes, Diane. What is the best measurement for knowing how well an organization is doing in, quote, the ability to build the capability? 
I'm going to quickly bifurcate that. Um, to me, there's potentially two questions there. If I take it at face value, you're saying, how well are we doing at having the ability in our organization to build an, a, a, an agile capability? That might be the question, but what more people might um, want to know first is, how are we doing at building the capability, you know, as opposed to building building the ability to build the capability, if, if that makes sense. Um, this is one of those things where, uh, in my experience, I, I generally place lighter value on most certifications, but as a proxy measure for how are we doing, I think that in this case, the kinds of certifications that exist in the coaching space, I have found to be among the more impactful and um, telling in terms of somebody has gone through this and what what how are they changed as a person when they come out of it? So like, have people been through formal coaching training? Like, do you have, um, you know, certifications around coaching, you know, not to toot our own horn, but around like the IC Agile, ICP, ACC certification. Like that was, that was my first entry into, you know, this world of coaching uh, about 10, 10 years ago. Um, so that would be something I would suggest is sort of like layer one. Richard, what would you add to that? Yeah, no, I like that. So um, that's that personal individual layer. Um, as an organization, uh, you know, we advocate for taking what we call an outcome-based approach to, to dealing with change. Um, and so as an organization, what, what benefit or what impact are we trying to create? And then we can kind of work our way back from that and we can measure our progress there accordingly. So there are some simple measures of, are we growing our capabilities? Meaning there are more people that are trying this um, and what is the impact that we're creating? So we can measure both at the individual level, we can measure at the system level, team level, organizational level, but you know, I we encourage focus on an impact or an outcome that you're trying to achieve and then identify the steps that you can take to build toward that. And, and it can be measured, but it will take time. Yep. Hopefully, we, right. hopefully we answered your question, Diane. Feel free to reach out to us if, if there's yeah. more, more to it. Happy to elaborate. Yeah. So thanks everybody, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Randy, as always. Love doing these webinars with you. Um, but again, feel free to reach out uh, and share your, you know, share your questions, share your experiences with others. That's that's a, a key element of this as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Richard.